spiny as I can get. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it sounds better without the door. <laughs> yeah? Well, that was your new sound. Oh no, the director. Let's just, we'll go through it anyway and then discuss. There he is. There's the bass player. Sorry, Nick. Aha! That's the clean channel. Uh, Might be a room in there. I put the amp on half power, so. solo album for give us some insight into the, the direction you're pursuing for it yeah well it's the same band so it's it's um, Guthrie Govan guitar Marco Miniman drums Nick Bakes bass Adam Holtzman on keyboards Theo is is involved in the record although less so and that's n no reflection on him that's simply because I've written less for Saxon flute this time and I think generally this album has probably got much less uh, of the of the Perhaps the jazz, strong jazz element that the last record has. Yeah, <laughs> In some ways, it seems like the next step to me from The Raven, but whereas The Raven was fairly consistent in tone because it had such a strong sort of concept and also I kind of was very much into the idea of making an album that sounded like it almost could have been made in 1972 like a real vintage um, old school progressive rock album and and I think we did that and, and I'm really proud of, of we did you know the fact we did that and did it did it pretty well but now I'm looking again to, to maybe bring in some of the other elements from my you know my my musical uh, repertoire, as it were. So we've got, you know, we've got electronic music on the album. We've got we've got a couple of real, almost straightforward for me anyway, straightforward pop tunes.
But we've also got three tracks that are long, more progressive influence tracks too. So in some ways it feels almost like a, um, uh, a combination of all my solo work and maybe all my work, you know, overall is kind of all somehow represented in this album. But can't ignore the crawl of your decline. How has the, uh, the, the chemistry of this band changed over time and, and how is it reflected on this album? I think last time it was quite, because we were kind of working together really for the first time, in fact when we recorded The Raven, I think in that, on that particular record we tended to play quite safe or I tended to play quite safe in how I would kind of, um, if you like, bait the musicians. Like, so. I just kind of let them do their thing and, and I think the Raven in some ways benefited from that approach because it's a very easy to enjoy a record, it's got a kind of classic rock sound all the way through, there's nothing that abrasive about it, there's nothing that will sort of snap you out of, of the mood of the record. This time I'm kind of pushing them a bit harder into experimenting, uh, with particularly Guthrie, with, with sounds and textures. Um, and and not just sticking to sort of the classic rock palette of sound, which is what I wanted to do anyway on, on the road. It's not, I'm not trying to suggest to you that, that it wasn't the way I wanted it to be. That is the way I wanted that record to be. But this time certainly we're stretching out more with, with the sounds. Um, and that comes from being more familiar with the musicians and what they're capable of doing. Um, so that certainly is, is a change sonically, I think, pushing people a bit harder. To, to experiment and maybe go beyond their own, you know, expectations. I will love you more than I'll ever show You only have to say The world will slip away from you basic um, story or concept of the record just kind of boiled down to one sentence it's about a woman growing up who goes to live in the city very isolated and she disappears one day and no one notices that's that's kind of like the basic just in a nutshell the concept of the album there's a lot more to it than that sometimes we would head down to blackbirds Moor. seed for me was seeing this film about this woman who died in London. It's a documentary called Dreams of a Life and it's a documentary about a woman called Joyce Carol Vincent who was found dead in her London apartment and she'd been for there for three years. Now what's really interesting about this story and if you see the documentary it's fascinating is that your initial reaction when you hear a story like that is oh, a little old bag lady that no one you know no one notices no one cares about she wasn't. She was young, she was popular, she was attractive, she had many friends, she had family, but for whatever reason, nobody missed her for three years. There was something about that that had so much pathos and so much, um, had so much to say about what it is to be living in the city in the 21st century. <laughs> once. That's my 
my favourite so far today. And the album's also unique in that you have a strong female vocal presence on it. Yes. Tell me uh, about uh, that and uh, who the singer is. The idea of the album is very much about um, a woman. It's written from a female perspective. Um, and so for me it was important not only to write from the female perspective but to have a more feminine sort of like um, voice on the record. So there's a couple of songs where I'm effectively duetting with a fantastic uh, singer uh, called Ninette. Uh, amazing, amazing voice, uh, very easy to work with, very inspiring uh, singer. So she is like providing the, the female voice on this record. And some of the tracks are written completely, you know, in the first person from a female, you know, the female voice. Uh, the, the song Routine, which I mentioned earlier, and also a song called Happy Returns, they are written in the first person. So I felt that it was only logical to, you know, to, to bring a female... Not all of the songs. Uh, it's, it's kind of like I sing a bit and then and then she sings a bit. And I'm very happy with it. You know, I, I wonder what people will make of it. I wonder what people will make of it. It, so, it sounds great to me. <laughs> Good also. Uh, I didn't really have a strong reference for which pickup, did you? No, they both no, sound yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, do you want to come and have a listen? But also, I went through a, a, a period of listening to a lot of Kate Bush. Probably my favourite Kate Bush album is the is the Dreaming. Uh, it's just astonishing record vocally, particularly what she does with her voice on that record is just nobody has ever bettered it for me. And there's one, but there's one song on that record called All of the Love. And there's a beautiful moment where her voice breaks off and the voice of a boy chorister takes over and effectively sings the chorus. A choir boy sings the chorus. And I've always loved the sound of, of you know, boy choristers. So we've actually got a 12-piece uh, boy choir group coming in to sing. That's exciting because that's something I've never, I've had a choir before but I've never had that, that um, ethereal kind of quality. And there's also a part for a solo boy chorister as in the, the Kate Bush track on a song called Routine. Um, so that's very exciting to me. It's obvious in a way that what you you know what you take in affects what you put out you know and so my input has always affected my output very strongly and I, as you know I love music and I'm a student of music I'm not one of those musicians that and there are to be honest this is probably the majority most musicians once they are in the industry they stop listening to music I, I find this almost 80 90 percent of the time once musicians are professional musicians they stop taking on new music themselves and that's never been my experience my experience has always been that I'm you know even more curious about music than ever
So I understand you have a large scale packaging concept for this record. Uh, tell me what we can expect. Yeah, it's very interesting to me to see how the special edition, the deluxe edition, has become almost like you know a meme in itself. It's like the norm now. And when I started with my first solo record uh, in Sohentes, it was quite unusual to do the hardback book, the cloth band book with the you know the, the large format of the multi disc. But in the last five years, it's become like it's weird if you don't do that. You know, if you're if you're like a, a classic rock band or a, you know anything, even dance bands doing it now, electronic bands doing. It. If you don't do the special edition, you know, it's it's kind of the anomaly as opposed to the norm. So now I'm looking. To, I was looking for a way to take things actually up a step, you know, and raise the bar again. And we're doing that in the form of diary entries, blog entries, but also all of the paraphernalia that you would associate with a life. Um, birth certificates, school reports, Polaroid photographs, um, photographs of lovers, you know, postcards from holiday. And the difference will be letters, and the difference will be that a lot of these will be loose items. So you will turn the page and there will be an envelope stuck to the, the page and you will open the envelope and you will take out a letter and you will unfold it and you will read the letter. So things will be inserted into the, the book that will effectively be loose. So it's a very ambitious, very expensive thing to do. It's going to be very elaborate and it will effectively be like a document of a life, somebody's life. Lasser is in control, is, is kind of uh, taking taking note over the kind of whole side of, of the photography. Hayo is doing some of the illustration. And then Carl Glover also is, is very key to this because Carl is brilliant at basically being able to create, um, you know, uh, imitations of official documents. We have, we have newspaper cuttings, you know, fake newspaper cuttings, but they'll hopefully be so convincing that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You know, even going down to the level of detail, like, where you've cut out a newspaper cutting, there's some random stuff on the back, you know, whether it's the sports results or something. That level of attention and detail, Carl is, is brilliant at that. It's a massive, massive, you know, sort of headache to do. So I think it's going to be something really beautiful and, and hopefully, you know, raise the bar again as, as far as the packaging is concerned. So what attracts you to these giant concepts, particularly for your solo work? You know, I grew up with um, books, and music together. I mean, I wasn't just listening to records, I was listening to records while I was reading. And so the idea of the, the musical journey as a kind of narrative, I guess, was ingrained in me from a very early age, from always kind of associating listening to music with, with reading stories, and stories that had a kind of na narrative arc. And at the same time, of course, the music I was listening to tended towards the more, you know, conceptual albums. I, I, from a very early age, I loved, you know, my father was listening to Pink Floyd records, my mother was listening to Giorgio Moroder, Donna Summer records, which in their own way are conceived as very kind of conceptual, you know, musical journeys. And some of the, some of the Donna Summer albums have like 17 minute tracks taking up a whole of a side and, and the way the grooves develop and the, and the narrative of the music in itself tells a story in its own in its own right, not just lyrically. So I was listening to those kind of records and at the same time I was obsessed with literature. So for me it was always about trying to be trying to tell a story through the music and through the lyrics. And and I also tend I also had a tendency to also be very much attracted to the more melancholic, you know, side of of all the you know the human condition, you know, and, and the problems inherent in, you know, in trying to make sense of the gift of life, you know, and, and as a 15 or 14 year old, you know, teenage boy reading K 
Kafka and Hermann Hesse and going into school and feeling very pretentious and very holier than thou, you know, that's always been there in me, you know, you know, um, they're, they're, you know, searching for answers and searching for meaning, as we all do, you know, everyone does it. They're things that I come back to time and time again, but they're actually things that musicians come back to time and time again. I mean, most of the classic concept records are about the same thing, actually. Quadrophenia, The Wall, they're about the same thing. They're about isolation, paranoia, a feeling of detachment from the technological world that we live in, and a kind of retreat from that technological world. Um, it just seems to be the number one subject for musicians like myself to write, to build albums around. But like love, there are so many different ways to, to write music about it. Um, Fear of a Blank Planet obviously was very much tied up with the, the, the world of you know, technology and the internet and how that had affected particularly young, young kids and their ability to interface with other human beings, or, or not as the case may be. This is a very different story about isolation. This is about one individual. It's about one individual that um, finds themselves um, retreating from the rest of the world, not because of technology, just because of who knows, who knows why. There are people out there like that. Um, they just for whatever reason don't feel like they fit in to the planet or, or, or the planet in this time anyway, you know, 20, the 21st century. I mean, you know, we all we all have feelings like that, you know. We all sort of say, you know, sort of shake our heads and say we don't understand the, you know, the modern world we live in. We don't understand the younger generation, all this stuff, you know. We all do it, you know. So it's I think it is a it is a, a universal. And as I say, I think it is a subject that I come back to time and time again. But it's a subject that musicians come back to time and time. OK Computer is another example of a, of a classic, you know, contemporary rock album. But it's an album about, you know, alienation. The same things that Pete Townsend and Roger Waters were writing about in the 70s. So I think these are universal so topics that can be, as I say, like love, you know, how many love songs have been written, but there's still always a way to make it seem fresh, apparently. Is there any element of autobiography in this uh, record? I think it's impossible to write any song without there being some element of autobiography. I don't think you can fake it. 
even though I'm writing from the perspective of a female about a situation that I haven't, you know, literally been in myself, I'm actually still writing about me. You know, you, that's what you always do. You write about your hopes, your fears, your dreams, your, you know, your loves, your, your losses, your paranoias. You, but you channel them through whatever character you have chosen to be the vessel. And because I think if you don't do that, people won't feel it there anyway. You know, if you if you try and fake it. So I think actually, ultimately, whether you're writing a song from your completely autobiographical place or from a completely fictional place. It's still autobiographical, really, because you're drawing on your own experience. You have to. The feelings have to be real. So yes, I'm all of the feelings that this female character of loneliness, melancholia, happiness, detachment, isolation. Of course, I have felt all those things, as I think most people have, most adults have at least. So yes. Hey, brother. I see the freaks and dispossessed on their release Avoiding the police I feel I'm falling once again But now there's no one left to catch me Hey brother, I feel I'm living in parentheses And I got trouble with the bed Remember